This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. And somebody handed me a helmet and a riot stick and, and said, come on, we're going in the yard and get this thing back under control. And I can remember running down the stairs here thinking, this is really stupid. I could get killed out here, you know? You know, it was one of those feelings that somebody's getting ready to take a shot at you or something. You know, it was just a scary, scary feeling. And in fact, the inmate that started the fire uh, in the kitchen, I could see his hand through the window. It was dark at night, but I could see his hand. It was his left hand. He had a piece of paper that was on fire, and I could see him hold it out and drop it. They never intentionally set the chapel on fire. It was the heat from the kitchen. When I was sitting on that wrestling mat with the body under my feet, and I was eating that sandwich and drinking this red Kool-Aid when the Ada County detectives came in and said, doesn't this bother you? And I said, I guess not, I, you know. <laughs> I was hungry. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Behind Gray Walls, the first episode in our series, Disturbing Justice. This is a season about all of the uprisings and disturbances that happened here in the history of the penitentiary, and it actually is going to be a companion piece to our new exhibit, also called Disturbing Justice. So this is the 1910 riot, Snook Sense, and our sources for this episode, bear with us, there are going to be very long at the top. Some sources from Wikipedia, Jack Johnson, Glacier National Park, U.S. Bureau of Mines, and Ed Pulaski, Library of Congress Chronicling America Project, the Forest History Society article on the 1910 fires at foresthistory.org, the Great Fire of 1910 by the USDA Forest Service, the Warden's Biennial Report of 1909 to 1910, many Idaho Daily Statesman articles, and the history behind the walls of the Folsom State Prison by Sarah Heisey from kcra.com and records on ancestry.com. The year is 1910. William Taft has been president for one year. The country is in the throes of the progressive era, a period of time characterized by reform. Nearly every aspect of society is being transformed and changed thanks to reform groups protesting and fighting, sometimes violently for their cause, as referenced by President Taft in this recorded speech. In order to induce their employer into a compliance with their request for changed terms of employment, workmen have the right to strike in a body. To use such persuasion as they may, provided it does not reach the point of duress, to lead their reluctant co-laborers to join them in their union against their employers, to accumulate funds to support those engaged in a strike, to delegate to officers the power to direct the action of the union, and to withdraw themselves and their associates from dealing with or giving custom to those with whom they are in controversy. What they have not the right to do is to injure their employer's property to injure their employer's business by use of threats or methods of physical duress against those who would work for it, or by carrying on what is sometimes known as a secondary boycott against his customs. In the labor sector, unions like the American Federation of Labor and the International Workers of the World lobbied for the five-day work week, the eight-hour work day, and the abolishment of child labor. In social reform, abstinence groups such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League called for the prohibition of the production and consumption of alcohol across the country, while suffragettes continued to fight for women's right to vote. Even culture was changing. Amusement parks like Coney Island became a popular getaway for young Americans to spend their leisure money and their day off. And early movies like Nickelodeons, which cost only five cents to enter and featured short narratives, became another popular way for all Americans to spend the free time and money they had gained through labor reform. On July 4th, 1910, in Reno, Nevada, Jack Johnson, an African-American boxer, beat James J. Jeffries, the previously undefeated heavyweight white boxer who came out of retirement specifically to fight Johnson. After the match was over, race riots broke out across the country, from Los Angeles to Colorado to Texas, from New York to Washington, D.C. Many white citizens felt that Jeffries had been, quote, a great white hope, demonstrating the superiority of their race and were humiliated by the loss. 
An article from the New York Tribune on July 5th, 1910 read, quote, rioting broke out like prickly heat all over the country last night between whites sore and angry that Jeffries had lost the big fight at Reno and Negroes jubilant that Johnson had won. The tension that existed everywhere vented itself in most cases in street scuffles. In all, there were disturbances in 11 large cities from New York, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia in the Northeast to New Orleans, Atlanta, St. Louis, Little Rock, and Houston in the South and Southwest. There was more rioting in New York City than in almost all of the rest of the country combined. It was reported that riots occurred in over 25 states and 50 cities, with at least 20 people killed and hundreds more injured. On a more positive note, on May 11, 1910, Congress and President Taft passed and signed the bill that established Glacier National Park in northern Montana, a national park encompassing over 1 million acres, two mountain ranges, 130 lakes, over 1,000 species of plants, and hundreds of species of animals. In an important step for many western states, including Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming, on May 16th, Congress authorized the creation of the United States Bureau of Mines, an agency that conducted scientific research and disseminated information on extraction, processing, use, and conservation of mineral resources. For northern Idaho, however, the summer of 1910 proved to be one of the worst in recent memory. On August 10th, reports began to come into the District 1 Forest Service office in Missoula, Montana, that fires had broken out and were quickly spreading to the Clearwater, Lolo, Cabinet, Flathead, Blackfeet, and Canuxu National Forest in northern Montana. Fires then began popping up in the Idaho Panhandle and even Washington and Oregon, spurred on by the fact that 1910 was the driest year in anyone's memory. At this point, the Forest Service persuaded President Taft to deploy troops to supplement civilian firefighters. By August 19th, most of the fires appeared under control and supervisors began releasing troops and employees. However, only a day later, on August 20th, hurricane force winds swept through the region and fanned embers and low flames back to life. By this time, the fire was too big to stop or contain. Citizens could only hope to avoid it. Also, I just got chills. Like, this whole event is so so insane. Trains raced to evacuate towns just ahead of the flames reaching them. The massive resurgence of the forest fires over August 20th and August 21st was called the Big Blow Up. Within a matter of hours, fires became firestorms and trees were uprooted and became flying blow torches. Fireballs leaped canyons half a mile wide in one fluid motion. Can you even imagine? Seeing that, having to live through that, and just being like, what would you do if you saw fire literally jump? from like an edge of a canyon to the i i don't that's genuinely one of the most terrifying things i think i can even imagine I, I, yeah i'm like speechless thinking I, it's, about this even the yeah. chills that i got just read i even wrote this and reading it still i just insane oh oh man one idahoan captured the popular imagination as a hero of the great fires of 1910 Edward Crockett Ed Pulaski joined the Forest Service in 1908 and lived with his wife and daughter in Wallace, Idaho, when the fires quickly approached Wallace. Ranger Pulaski took a crew of 43 men 10 miles southwest of Wallace to fight the fires, but the crew was quickly overwhelmed by the flames. Pulaski ordered his crew into an abandoned mine shaft to escape the inferno, barely outrunning the fire. He hung blankets over the entrance of the shaft and doused the blankets in water until he was overwhelmed with smoke and the men could do nothing but wait out the night on the tunnel floor. When the men awoke the next morning, all but five had survived. Ed's quick thinking saved the lives of nearly his entire crew. Despite the damage that Pulaski sustained to his eyes and lungs from the fire, he invented a tool called the Pulaski, used in wildland firefighting in 1911, which became a national standard in 1930. Between the Great Fire and his retirement from the Forest Service in 1929, Pulaski petitioned the government for money to care for the graves of the dozens of firefighters killed by the Great Fire. The mine entrance, now known as the Pulaski Tunnel, is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And I actually got to hike that when I went Mm. up to Wallace, and it's a this beautiful long hike through the mountains and and you're just like you know they were fighting a fire running through this wow. to find this tiny little trail and when we got there we were like this is it like that many men were crowded in this tiny wow. little cavern it's unbelievable that's yeah. crazy jeez Unsurprisingly, several Idaho newspapers covered aspects of the fire. Here are just a few excerpts from various newspapers around the state. The Kendrick Gazette, August 26. Quote, 
Smoke has not yet cleared the skies of Wallace and other towns in Coeur d'Alene country, and there are forest fires still in progress. But the general feeling is that the danger has passed, except in the St. Joe region. With the worst over, Wallace and her sister towns of the Coeur d'Alene's are sitting back, frayed but not beaten. The loss of life will be large. It grows hourly, and the number of injured is constantly increasing. In and around Wallace is estimated here the death list is at least 50. In addition to at least 25 others hurt, it is said that 10 persons have been made blind. The loss to the city is estimated at close to $1 million, about half of the city being saved. The bodies of the dead are being burned where found. It may be weeks before a complete estimate of the fatalities can be made. From the Elmore County Republican, August 27th, quote, Fire situation in Idaho, one to strike terror to souls of men. With over 50 persons known to be dead, with 100 or more missing and a list of injured that will approximate 200, with half the town of Wallace swept clean, and the possibility that two or three more towns in the district have suffered complete destruction, with half a dozen or more small towns and villages seriously threatened, and the inhabitants by the thousands hurrying to places of safety, the Pacific Northwest faces the most terrible forest fire situation in its history. The Caldwell Tribune, September 2nd, quote, Their nerves racked by their terrible experience with the forest fire near Avery, but so happy to be alive that they danced and sang on their walk into Wallace over the Placer Creek Trail. A party of Wallace men and others arrived in the city last night under the leadership of William Seitz. Most of the men had been prospecting at the Silica Gold and Copper property. They went to Forest Ranger Kotke's home for the noon meal Sunday and were driven in haste from there a half mile up the Milwaukee Railroad track to a railroad water tunnel near one of the trestles. It was open at both ends. For two solid hours we lay on our stomachs with our faces in the mud, said Seitz last night in telling the experience of the party. If the tunnel hadn't been open, we might have been goners, for I believe the draft saved us. For that matter, it was a mere chance that any of us were saved. We were sleeping Saturday night at the Silica when the fire came upon us. It was traveling then at a ray of not less than 40 miles an hour. It was about 10 o'clock Saturday night that I woke and got up, going to the door to see how things looked. I saw the fire right at hand. I yelled for the men, for God's sake, get out of here. We grabbed a few of our clothes and ran. After August 22nd, wind slowed, temperatures dropped, and on the night of the 23rd, light rain caused the horror to finally subside. Official reports estimate that 1,736 fires burned more than 3 million acres of private and federal land and consumed 7.5 billion board feet of timber. Enough timber to build 800,000 houses. That's insane. The east end of the town of Wallace was burned down, and several small towns in the middle of the burn were completely destroyed according to some wallace residents quote in some brick buildings only the walls were left standing while nothing was left of the wood buildings of the furniture there was nothing left but the iron and steel parts and those were sadly out of shape all glassware was melted apples were baked on the trees appalling desolation was everywhere at least 86 people were killed smoke from the fires reached new england and soot traveled all the way up to greenland it is considered perhaps the largest forest fire in american history and likely one of the largest forest fires in recorded world history while northern idaho worked to recuperate from the devastation of the great fire of 1910 the idaho state penitentiary in the southern part of the state was just as steady as it had always been as of november 30th 1910 Warden John W. Snook was in charge of 212 inmates, 210 men, and two women. 95 were received at the penitentiary in 1910, while 92 were discharged the same year. The two women were Jenny Daly, who entered on February 25, 1905, for a charge of manslaughter, and Clara Day, who entered on May 29, 1910, for assault with a deadly weapon. Racially, the prison had 196 white inmates, 12 Negro, or African-American inmates, including one of the female inmates, and four Indian, or Native American inmates. All but two of the inmates claimed some denomination of Christianity as their religious affiliation, including 67 Catholics, 46 Methodists, and 22 Baptists. One inmate claimed a Jewish religious affiliation, and one claimed none at all. <laughs> 
174 inmates claim nativity in the United States. Surprisingly, Idaho was not the state in which most of the inmates were born. New York held that distinction with 17 inmates claiming it as their birth state. Pennsylvania followed with 16, Idaho with 15, Illinois with 14, and Missouri with 12. 37 of the then 46 states were represented in the prison population. The remaining 38 inmates born outside of the United States were born almost exclusively in Europe, with the exception of 10 inmates. Six were born in Mexico and four were born in Canada. 28 European inmates hailed from Austria, Denmark, England, France, Finland, Germany, Italy, Ireland, Norway, Scotland, Sweden, and Slavonia. Now part of Croatia. Uh, Most of the legitimate occupations claimed by the inmates are not surprising, given the common industries around the state. 34 inmates were farmers, 33 general laborers, 19 miners, 12 were teamsters, 11 cooks, and 10 waiters. Other common jobs included barbers, blacksmiths, and accountants, and even cowboys. Because occupations were reported by the inmates themselves, some of the answers are creative to say the least, such as one actor-artist, or one inmate who was so young that he listed his occupation as schoolboy. Some occupations, such as steamboat hands, ship carpenters, or even boiler makers, may not have been as useful in Idaho, likely pointing to the fact that these inmates were from outside the state. The majority of inmates received a common school education at most, only 19 attending higher education, while seven were illiterate altogether. The 212 inmates together committed 25 different crimes from 22 different jurisdictions. The most common crimes were burglary in the first degree. 50 inmates. Forgery. 26 inmates. Grand larceny. 26 inmates. And murder in the second degree. 20 inmates. Some of the lesser crimes included injuring a public jail, burglary with explosives, and making an unauthorized sale of grain. Sentences ranged anywhere from six months to life, including two inmates who were sentenced to death, with the most inmates, 45, serving from one to 14 years. The top five most common jurisdictions from which inmates were received were Bannock, 38, Kootenai, 23, Bingham, 21, Ada, 17, and Canyon and Lincoln counties, 13 each. One inmate committed a federal offense for which his jurisdiction was listed as U.S. Courts. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the prison population was overwhelmingly young. Of the 212 inmates, 189 were younger than 45 years old. 16 inmates were between the ages of 15 and 20, and two were between the ages of 65 and 70, while the majority of inmates fell between ages 20 and 30. Likely because the prison population was so young, 144 listed their conjugal relations as single. Only 38 were married. Inmates also included 16 widowers and one widow. And that widow was Jenny Daly because she killed her husband. Yeah. It should be noted that inmates reported these statistics themselves, so the finality of these numbers should be considered with a grain of salt or two. However, it would likely not be unfair to state the majority of the population of the Idaho State Penitentiary in 1910 were white, single, young laborers who often resorted to thievery or burglary, perhaps because they did not believe their wages were enough to get by. In 1899, construction began on two cell houses to house inmates. It took 10 years for one of the cell houses to be completed. The South Wing, now Three House, was finished in 1909. But as I profiled last season, it was almost immediately unusable as the cell doors were easily removed by essentially carving the hinges out of the stone walls. Instead, that stone went to build the prison barn outside the walls. By 1910, the North Wing, now called Two House, had been completed, according to the 1909 to 1910 biennial reports. Quote, the North Wing has been entirely completed and now contains 40 of the Pauley Jail Buildings Company's modern steel cells, with the latest sliding doors and locking device, which causes a decided contrast with the antiquated cells in the South Wing, as the cell block is antique, although but of recent construction and should be torn out in the steel sold and the stone used in building a barn. From this statement, we learned something rather interesting. When Two House was completed, it contained only 40 steel cells. This is a rather interesting tidbit of information because today, and for all of its history, the completed cell block had 80 cells. A year later, another 40 cells were completed, meaning that our current building, which has four stories, had only two stories in 1910. Both buildings, cells and all, were built by the inmates themselves. In the Bayanu report, Warden John W. Snook makes very clear his opinion on having inmates work. Quote, The state should make adequate provisions for the employment of its inmates. Idleness is always demoralizing, 
but nowhere more so than in forced and long confinement. Failure to furnish some useful and productive form of industry makes a permanent idler of him who was once industrious. And not only is the prisoner injured by idleness, but the prison itself. A score of idle or partly idle convicts can do more mischief, subvert more discipline, destroy more regularity and system than a regiment of men kept at proper legitimate employment. And I have no hesitancy in saying that, in my opinion, the very key to proper discipline is a labor system that embraces in its scope every person in a prison fit to work. We have at this time 150 able-bodied men that could be put to work in a factory or cutting stone, and then have enough men for the general routine and farm work. Though not explicitly mentioned in the biennial report, one institution which the prison used to employ the men was the prison quarry on the other side of Table Rock from the penitentiary. The young, healthy inmates were often employed to march to the quarry every day and work back-breaking labor to pull sandstone from the ground. The sandstone was then shaped by other inmates and used not just to build buildings on the prison campus, but in other buildings around Boise, including the Idaho State Capitol building. No mention of the prison quarry is made in biennial reports after 1948. We do not have an official date of when the prison began using the prison quarry either. The two earliest mentions of it come in 1891 and 1883. According to the Wood River Times on September 21st, 1891, quote, We learned from the Boise statesman that a rigid investigation of the state penitentiary is about to be made. We do not know how rigid this proceeding will be, but do know that similar proceedings elsewhere have ended in a whitewashing. In this instance, we hope for a better outcome. The state prison quarry is exploited by a political striker who is given the soft snap of employing convicts at 50 cents each per day, which is just about one-fourth of the cost of the aboard Chinese cheap labor. This should be stopped at once, if for no better reason because the practice will, if continued, result in the alienation from the dominant party of the labor vote of Idaho. Then, too, the recent prize fight at the penitentiary should be looked into. If, as stated, Warden Mack not only permitted but actually participated in it and wagered money on the result, he should be decapitated without any ceremony. This la- <laughs> no, that's I a, love decapitated. Just a terrible. A, wow. That's a bit much. Yeah. <laughs> this last incident refers to an article published in The Statesman on September 8, 1891, that detailed how boxing matches were not only occurring in the penitentiary, but that, quote, within the past two months, several pugilistic encounters have occurred there with the full consent of the officers, and in one case, the guards acted as timekeeper, while other officers watched the pugilists bruise each other in good shape. One inmate, Dick Dunlap, badly beat another convict named McCreary. Although this was supposed to be a, quote, finish fight, some of the other prisoners believed a young 16-year-old English inmate named John Braithwaite could, quote, do up Dunlap. After training for several days, the fight was on. Quote, the fight was a fast and furious one, Dunlap proving to be no match for his agile and scienced antagonist, who hit him about when and where he pleased, bruising him up shamefully and at last knocking him completely out. It is narrated that the gloves used by Braithwaite were dripping with blood, and Dunlap's face was a mass of gore. The contest was of such brutal character that even the guards were appalled, and no similar amusements have been allowed since. It was also believed that convicts and guards alike were betting on the fight. The statesman called for an investigation of the warden. During the investigation, several guards and even Braithwaite himself testified that the fight had been nothing more than an average boxing match. The gloves the fighters wore were between six and eight ounces, commonly called pillows. Though Dunlap's nose bled, there was no such thing as a knockdown and, quote, in a few minutes you could not tell they had been sparring. After Dunlap's nose began to bleed, he would not answer the referee's count, and the match was given to Braithwaite. One guard admitted to betting $5 with another guard, but overall, the account from the first statesman article had been embellished. There were also charges of whiskey being brought into the premises and several guards being drunk while on duty during the fight. In November 1891, after listening to all the testimony, the Secretary of State A.J. Pinkham found the charges against Warden Mack to be baseless, and he retained his post until March 1892 when he retired, following accusations of carelessness and being short nearly $500 in prison accounts. Which is a good reason to be, uh, to retire. 
Because of the larger investigation over the boxing corruption, the potential scandal involving the prison quarry was swallowed up and likely resolved. The earliest mention of the prison quarry, then, came from the Idaho Semi-Weekly World on March 27, 1883, detailing four convicts who escaped while working in the quarry. Quote, Last Thursday, between the hours of 4 and 5 o'clock p.m., four convicts made their escape from the penitentiary. Two of the guards were guarding them at work in the stone quarry when the prisoners sprang upon them, disarmed them, and fled to the river. The prisoners were Randolph Johnson, Burglary, W.J. Hayes, Grand Larceny, Charles Chambers, Robbery, and Moroni Hicks, Murder in the Second Degree. According to another Daily Statesman article, Hayes seized guard C.D. Chin and placed a hand over his mouth while the other inmates grabbed his guns. When the other guard, George Newman, looked up to see if Chin was bringing the men, he found himself staring into the barrel of the guns in the hands of inmates. Fred Dubois, U.S. Marshal of the Idaho Territory, offered $600 for their capture. The governor of the Idaho Territory, John B. Neal, offered an additional $150 per convict, and Warden Richards offered $100 per convict. After their escape, Johnson, Chambers, and Hicks went up the river six miles, had supper at the home of a man named McMahon, and then, quote, helped themselves to three good horses. Four days after their escape, they were spotted in Middleton, 23 miles away from the prison. All of the convicts, save Hicks, had attempted to escape from the penitentiary once before, and their previous recapture had obviously not deterred them. On April 2, 1883, a little over a week after making his escape, Randolph Johnson was caught by Mr. McMahon, from whom he and his companions had stolen horses. By this time, Johnson had separated from the others and was found at a ranch near Catherine Creek, just outside a mountain home, 60 miles south of Boise. Moroni Hicks was recaptured on April 14th, found near Canyon City, Oregon, nearly 200 miles from where he started. On June 30th, 1883, the marshal received word from the sheriff of San Bernardino, California, that a man matching the description of J.W. Hayes was in his custody. Finally, word reached Idaho on September 4th, 1883, that Charles Chambers was on the mend in jail in Benicia, California, north of San Jose, after being shot in the chest. Now, it seems like we're going down a lot of rabbit holes, but that's because I kept digging and yeah. kept finding all of this really cool stuff. Yeah. So just bear with us. We'll get to the to the uprising soon, but this is just super interesting. Yeah. At the beginning of August, Chambers had attempted to rob Judge Lynch at his home, pointing a pistol at his head. The judge tried to grab the barrel of the gun to disarm Chambers, but Chambers was too quick and made the judge turn around. Fearing that Chambers would accidentally shoot him, Lynch asked if he could get the valuables himself, to which Chambers agreed. Lynch handed over his gold watch and chain and $3.50 in cash. Chambers then walked Lynch a few streets away, when Chambers suddenly took off in a dead sprint back toward the way they had come. The judge ran around the block and found Constable Farron informing him of the incident. With fellow officer Murphy, Farron took off after Chambers. A few streets away, Farron and Murphy came upon Chambers, and Farron grabbed Chambers by the arm. From the statesman, quote, No sooner had Farron touched the fellow than he turned and fired, the ball entering his cheek near his mouth and coming out of the neck just below the ear. He then turned and fired on Murphy, the ball just grazing the top of his head and cutting the scalp. As he turned to shoot at Murphy, Officer Farron shot him, the ball entering near the shoulder blade. The three continued in a firefight before Chambers ran out of bullets and began running. Murphy overtook him, tackled him to the ground, and Farron knocked him out by striking him on the top of the head with his pistol. Chambers was shackled and taken to a drugstore to tend his wounds, where the doctor found a bullet not just in the chest near his lung, but as well as in his leg just above the knee. A crowd began to gather around the drugstore, demanding to lynch Chambers, but the officers held them off and took Chambers to jail instead. After some time, Chambers was returned to Idaho. Wow. Jeez. And these are just the four men who were first escaped from the very first mention of the quarry in the newspaper. Yeah. So <laughs> not is... even related to where we were, where we're going. <laughs> right. So this would not be the only time that prisoners working in the quarry would cause trouble. Leading up to 1910, tensions were building in the Idaho State Penitentiary. But before we get into that, we need to go back to 1903 in Folsom, California. In the Folsom State Prison, on the morning of July 27, 1903, the inmates marched to breakfast in the dining room. As breakfast began, Warden Thomas Wilkinson, Captain R.J. Murphy, stenographer Harry A. Wilkinson, who was also the warden's nephew, and five or six guards met in the captain's office, as they did every morning, to have a session of prison court, during which complaints against convicts laid by guards or officials was investigated. 
After finishing breakfast, about 300 of the near 700 total inmates were in the main yard when two inmates attacked turnkey W.A. Chalmers, apparently the only guard escorting the prisoners, while 12 other inmates rushed to the captain's office, only a few feet away from the yard. Each inmate was armed with a file knife or razor. None of the guards or officials in the office had any weapons on them. The inmates ordered them to line up and march. Upon learning that something was wrong in the main yard, other officers sprang into action. General Overseer Joseph Cochran was the first to arrive on the scene with a cane and began using it on inmates. Within moments, the inmates were nearly on top of Cochran with shivs and razors. Two other guards, William L. Cotter and Charles Jolly, were also attacked. Warden Wilkinson had been slashed across the abdomen, but did not notice for nearly six hours. According to an article that appeared in the Statesman, quote, the captain's office looked like a slaughterhouse. Once the prisoners had control of the officials, they marched them to the armory and, still threatening them with weapons, demanded that the doors be open. Quote, it was a case of open the door or slaughter the warden, captain, and other officials, and the convicts declared that if a shot was fired, they would murder every prisoner. Wilkinson told the guards to open the armory door, and the convicts took 10 rifles, 25 revolvers, and ammunition before marching to the gate, demanding it to be opened. The gate was opened, and 13 inmates walked out of the prison untouched, officials still at their mercy. Only a quarter of a mile from the prison, according to the Statesman article, Warden Wilkinson, who was described as stout, became short of breath and asked to be released. The inmates did so and kept walking with the other officials. When the convicts and officials were three-quarters of a mile from the prison, an alarm was sounded, alerting the immediate vicinity of the escape, and a call was made to Folsom and the entire state of California. Once the alarm had been sent up, Captain Murphy was released, but not before the convicts took his trousers from him. Harry Wilkinson was also released without his coat, vest, trousers, and shoes. Another official was stripped of his trousers, and all officials were given the prisoners' stripes to wear back to the prison. The fugitives then continued on, ransacking homes, taking provisions, clothing, and horses, having a half-hour head start on prison officials who began the manhunt for them. At the end of the escape, guard William Cotter was dead from deep stab wounds in his abdomen. Overseer Joseph Cochran was seriously wounded from two deep stab wounds in his back. Guard Charles Jolly had non-fatal wounds in his neck and arm. Turnkey W.A. Chalmers had non-fatal wounds in his hands and arm and Warden Wilkinson was slightly wounded in the abdomen. It was originally reported that Cochran had been killed in the melee, but about a month later, a report stated that he, quote, was so nearly killed. Other than the 13 inmates who escaped, however, the inmates who had been marching to the yard after breakfast did not cause any trouble of their own. Of the 13 inmates who escaped, one was shot dead only one day after escaping, one committed suicide after being recaptured, five were recaptured, and six remained at large. This event at Folsom, a much larger and theoretically more secure prison, likely caused concerns over similar incidents happening at smaller prisons like the one in Idaho. However, the Idaho State Penitentiary did not have any major riot or escape attempts until seven years later in 1910. Tensions began to build quickly in April after two major events. The first occurred at 1 o'clock a.m. on the early, early morning of April 3, 1910, when inmate number 1463 Tom Harris and inmate 1625 John Cunningham attempted to escape. Tom Harris, who the newspapers refer to as Thomas Harris, but who also went by the alias William Donnelly, entered the Idaho State Penitentiary in 1908 on a charge of burglary. The statesman described Harris as, quote, one of the smoothest crooks that ever operated in this state. <laughs> He'd already had a successful escape attempt from the prison in the summer of 1909, and while briefly free, quote, held up half a dozen people in cabins near Middleton, and he also turned several tricks at Parma, where the town constable placed him under arrest, but after comparing him with the Description sent out from the prison, released him. He was recaptured in Nyssa, Oregon, and returned to the penitentiary. He accrued eight additional charges of burglary and robbery while out on his escape and had at least two more years to serve by 1910. John Cunningham entered the penitentiary in 1909 on a charge of burglary in the second degree after burglarizing a pawn store in Boise. At 1.30 a.m. on November 22, 1909, Cunningham smashed a window at the Jenkins Brothers pawn shop on Main Street between 6th and 7th Street, reached in, and picked up two guns and some cheap jewelry. A night watchman by the name of E.W. E.B. heard the crash, and as he approached Cunningham, Cunningham drew a gun on him, demanding he put his hands up. Cunningham then alighted the officer and took off on 7th Street towards Idaho Street. 
E.B. fired his own revolver twice, missing both times, when Cunningham ran headlong into Captain Van Dorn and Patrolman Marion of the Boise Police, who drew their weapons and placed him under arrest. On Cunningham's person was found a 38 Colt and a 32 Forehand and Wadsworth, neither of which were loaded, as well as eight cheap rings and a pair of shears. He was sentenced to serve from six months to five years. For several nights leading up to April 3, 1910, Harris and Cunningham worked together patiently prying loose and picking out bricks from the brick ventilator that ran through the center of the cells of the territorial prison building. They replaced the bricks during the day. One trustee had alerted the warden that he thought he heard someone working on the brick in the cell, and Warden Snook ordered all the cells to be searched. Every cell in the cell house was searched, except for Cunningham's and Harris's, as at the time of the shakedown, Cunningham lay on the top bunk, feigning illness, and guards could not get in to search. Once all the bricks were loosened, at 1 a.m. on April 3rd, they worked their way up the ventilator, cut a hole through the roof, and, quote, made a dash for liberty just as the guards discovered their absence and started in pursuit. The problem was, once they were on the roof, they had to get down. The territorial prison building was 33 feet tall, though they had a rope made of blankets and, quote, pants goods from the prison tailor shop. Cunningham saw the height and, not believing the rope could hold them both, quote, hesitated for fear of falling and did not take the chance of the long leap to the ground and was caught on the roof. Harris, however, leaped safely, ran rapidly toward the front gate and scrambled like a monkey over the wall. Just as he went over the top, one of the guards took a shot at him with a rifle but missed in the darkness. Immediately after the escape, Warden Snook sent guards Carl Pyatt and George Roberts to watch the railway track at the end of Warm Springs Avenue. Sure enough, Harris came running along the tracks. Both guards fired their rifles at him but missed in the dark. Harris ducked into the bushes and later reappeared farther down the track, running in a zigzag pattern so the guards had a harder time hitting him. At daylight, Snook directed his men to keep moving along the track, believing that Harris would double back to the track once he thought the police moved on so that he could travel quicker. Sure enough, searchers found Harris's track along the road, through town, over the bridge, and out by the old fairgrounds. The nearby slaughterhouse reported the theft of a large knife, which police suspected Harris took as a weapon. The police continued to follow the tracks until dark when the hunt had to be postponed. Harris' stripes were found in the morning after his escape in a ditch behind the natatorium. It is believed he took a coat belonging to M. H. Goodwin, who lived near the penitentiary, and noticed it was missing from his porch. Quote, Harris is not what is termed a dangerous criminal, Warden Snook said, and the people need not fear being harmed by the man. All he wants is to get away right now. He probably will steal more than he can carry in the next two days, however, and that is no joke either. We expect to either beat him out of his hiding place in the brush Monday morning, or else catch him as soon as the bloodhounds can be put on his trail. Draper's hounds from Spokane, considered to be the best manhunters in the Northwest, will be put on his tracks, and we anticipate no difficulty in ultimately slowing him down. The hounds the penitentiary used, Snook admitted, were too old to be of service in such a capacity, though he was in the process of getting younger dogs. Uh-huh. Ah. Two weeks later, on April 16th, Warden Snook believed that Harris was hiding out amongst the homesteaders in Middleton, gradually working and planning to cross into Washington. In the same Statesman article, Snook criticized local police, saying they had, quote, blundered badly, stating that no effort had been made to contact himself or any of his force after the reported appearance of Harris in the area. A Boise man saw a man who he was certain was Harris hiding in the brush near Middleton and telephoned the police. Desk Sergeant Marinin and Patrolman McDonald made a trip to the vicinity and returned to Boise without contacting anyone at the penitentiary. Upon hearing this, Snook dispatched Deputy Warden Rich to verify the claim and investigate the area himself. In the brush, he found tracks corresponding to Harris's shoe size. Snook then telephoned the Boise Police Department asking for an explanation. Sergeant Marinin told the warden that they had not found anything that he believed was worthwhile to contact the police about. The last mention of Harris in the Idaho Daily Statesman was on January 1st, 1911, in a recap of local news items from 1910. It read, quote, On the night of April 3rd, Thomas Harris and John Cunningham, prisoners in the penitentiary, made a dash for freedom, and Harris made a clean getaway while Cunningham was captured. Number 1463, Tom Harris, was never found again. He is one of 90 successful escapes of 500 attempts in the history of the penitentiary. After Harris's escape, Warden Snook could not catch a break, as it was likely that other inmates were emboldened by the actions of Harris. Up next, the moment you've all been waiting for, the 1910 riot. But first, 
This season of Behind Gray Walls, Disturbing Justice, as well as the Disturbing Justice exhibit, were made possible by the Boise City Department of Arts and History and the National Endowment for the Humanities. We would like to thank them for their generous support. On April 19, 1910, 22 convicts were being marched back from the prison quarry, dirty and grimy from a hard day's work. As the bull gang was near the women's ward, a few unnamed inmates looked at each other and said, Now! Suddenly, six inmates broke away from the line and rushed towards the warden's office, which was just inside the front doors of the administration building. Snook, from his office, heard the commotion and pulled a gun from his desk drawer. When the first inmate rushed into his door, he leveled his cock revolver at him. The men, completely astonished at Snook's readiness to meet their escape attempts, immediately raised their hands in surrender. Officers questioned the other prisoners who claimed that the six men represented them as a grievance committee sent to complain about the quality of their food while on the job, particularly that the meat was unfit to eat. According to the statesman, quote, whether this was merely a stall or whether the six convicts were bent on a general scheme of escaping is not positively known, but the officer stated last night that it looked very much as though the six prisoners intended to copy the famous Folsom prison break in California a few years ago when a number of convicts surrounded the warden and held them between themselves and the armed guards so that the guards could not shoot at them without hitting the warden. Early the next morning, two other inmates, number 1508 John Miller and number 1567, Edward Hyde, were pulling weeds in the garden outside of the walls. John Miller's real name was Odie Parmley, a 21-year-old steamship fireman born in Rock Island, Illinois. He was born in September 1886 to Dudley and Florida Parmley and was the oldest of four kids. He had a younger sister, Effie, and two younger brothers, Omer and Oscar, with only five years between Odie and Oscar. Born in Rock Island, Illinois, he was raised just across the state line in Kellogg, Iowa, his mother, Florida, died when he was 16 years old in 1904 of some kind of prolonged disease or condition. Her obituary says that she was, quote, ready for the change, and she had made her funeral arrangements before her death. She was only 43. Upon her death, Dudley and his siblings moved to South Dakota, though it appears that Odie left the family home and worked. His whereabouts for four years are unknown, but he next appears at the Idaho State Penitentiary, entering on December 24, 1908, on a two-year sentence for forgery in Bonner County. He was working on a farm near Boyer for a rancher named W.E. Stevenson. He finished his job and left the ranch, pocketing two blank checks from Stevenson's table. Miller then rode into Sandpoint and bought a bottle of ink and a pen and, quote, fixed up two checks with W.E. Stevenson's name on their face and endorsed John Miller. Miller took one of the checks in the sum of $65.75 to George M. Walker's store and got it cashed. He went to the Idaho Saloon and received $5 on the second check, which was for $67.75. George Walker heard Miller talking to a man outside the shop about getting out of town on the first train. Miller decided to stay and took the money to a clothing shop and spent about half of it on a suit and other accessories. By this time, George Walker had alerted authorities about the questionable check. They tracked down Miller and arrested him. He admitted to the forgeries, and the money and clothing were returned. Edward Hyde, alias Francis Riley, was born in Belfast, Ireland around 1886. Hyde was more difficult to track down than Odie Parmley was such a common name, so most information we have for him comes from his intake form. He had at least one sister, Maggie, and he attended common school until the sixth grade and was a member of the Catholic Church. His father died when Edward was 10 or 12, at which time he left his parents' home, probably to work. His mother died just three or four years later, when Edward was 15 or 16. He listed his legitimate occupation as musician and cook, and he had served an apprenticeship as a musician, but more specific details of his time as a musician is unknown. As his sister lived in New York City upon his intake, it seems likely that the Hydes entered the United States through Ellis Island and settled in New York City, a very common place for Irish immigrants to settle. Edward entered the Idaho State Penitentiary on June 4, 1909, sentenced to 18 months for burglary in Bannock County. He broke into the basement storehouse of a Greek store under the Salt Lake Saloon and was caught in the act of burglarizing the store. The newspaper stated that the basement of the Salt Lake Saloon was where, quote, the Greek colony for some time have stored their trunks and baggage and other goods. Hyde was at the time he was arrested trying on a suit of clothes and was ready to make his exit when the deputy halted him. The prisoner is a dope fiend. His case will no doubt go to the district court at their next term. <laughs> 
So Miller, or Parmley, and Hyde are working in the garden with some other inmates the morning after the six inmates attempted to surprise Warden Snook in his office. Together, they ask guard W.H. Martin if they could go to an outbuilding, perhaps on the pretense of getting tools. Martin allowed it, and when he wasn't looking, the two ran away into the foothills. Warden Snook, who had a rough April, is informed of the escape 30 minutes after they took off. He had clearly had enough. After Harris's escape, the ineptitude of the city police, and an attempted mutiny, it was time to deal with things himself. From the Statesman, April 21st, quote, Jumping on his horse, the warden instinctively headed for the place where it seemed the most probable the escapees would go, and his hunch came out as he expected. Miller and Hyde ran along the road to a point above Mosley's and Gray's ranches, where the bluff extends out almost to the river, leaving a narrow passage for the roadway. There they turned off and went into the hills. Warden Snook discovered their tracks and followed them out to Kelly Hot Springs on the east side of Table Rock and up on a small gulch that leads up to the ridge right into Highland Valley. The warden caught sight of the convicts before they saw him, and after shooting into the air to scare them, he covered the men with his gun. They did not attempt to resist, but gave in and were marched back to the prison. All eight inmates, the six who rushed the warden's office and Miller and Hyde, were put in the dungeon, where they were kept in complete darkness and given only bread and water to live on. A riot and several escape attempts had been thwarted in only a matter of hours. It was the quick thinking of Warden Snook, a hardened administrator who served in Alaska, Idaho, and later Georgia, that prevented any further unrest. Tune in on Saturday to hear Warden Snook's full story. Though we do not know precisely who the six inmates who rushed the warden's office were, we can finish the story of Edward Hyde and Odie Parmley. Hyde was released from the Idaho State Penitentiary on November 5, 1910 presumably receiving no extra time for his escape attempt. He served one year, five months, and one day for his 18-month sentence. Odie Parmley was released on December 24, 1910, serving out his entire two-year sentence. After his release, he relocated to South Dakota, likely to be closer to family. Between 1910 and 1925, he applied for a homestead from the U.S. General Land Office on the Standing Rock Reservation near the North Dakota state border. In two different land grants, Odie owned nearly 450 acres on the reservation. On October 21st, 1928, Odie married Grace Iron Dog, a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, who was 22 years his junior. Their son, Giles Joseph Parmley, who Odie called Joe, was born almost exactly nine months later on August 13th, 1929. Because Joe is half Standing Rock Sioux through his mother, he and Odie are listed on the U.S. Indian Census Rolls from 1932 through 1939. However, Grace Iron Dog is never listed on the Census Rolls with them, likely indicating that she died within three years of Joe's birth. Another interesting thing to note is that on the 1939 Census Roll, Joe is actually living in Chamberlain, South Dakota, about 200 miles away from his father's homestead. It is not known who he was living with, as Odie is listed as living on the reservation. In 1937, Odie probably moved Joe to Chamberlain, as an employment record places Odie in Chicago, Illinois, working for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad as a track laborer. He returned to the reservation in 1939 for the census, but according to a 1942 World War II draft card, within three years, Joe remained in Chamberlain, and Odie moved to Seattle, Washington, working at Wiseman's Cafe, on 3443 University Way, which is now Beatles Cafe. Odie remained in Seattle for the rest of his life, dying on December 27, 1963, at the age of 79. Wow, this was an information-packed episode, most of it contextual. So, what do we learn from this thwarted riot of 1910? First, do not mess with Warden John W. Snook. He will hunt you down himself as he believes the city police are inept, and he's just had a bad month. Second, if you're trying to be successful, it might be wisest not to copy the actions of a bunch of convicts from California, or anywhere, even if they were successful. Wardens around the country learned from the mistakes in Folsom, and they were ready. Lastly, the prison quarry, while lucrative and an important part of the prisons and state's history, worked inmates hard, but could also create major discontent. Inmate discontent never leads to good things. I guess it makes sense that the penitentiary administration cut ties with the quarry by the 1950s. All right. So that was the very first uprising yeah. that we know of. Yeah. Come check out our exhibition. Mm-hmm. It's opening later this month mm-hmm. in August. Nice work, Scott. Thank you, too. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. kind of fun. Yeah. 
So keep tuning in because we've got some fun ones coming up as well. Yeah, yeah, the summer of uh, insurrection and yeah. change. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Do your own time. Do your own number. We'll see you soon. If you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe so others can find our podcast. If you're interested in more Old Idaho Penitentiary information and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in this episode, follow the Old Idaho Penitentiary on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to learn more about the Idaho State Historical Society and its other sites, follow ID State Historical Society on Instagram or visit history.idaho.gov. If you have a question or comment for the hosts, please email us at behindgraywalls at gmail.com.